Okay, here we're going to talk about more about properties and using tables and finding things in tables. So this is module 2b, using tables and evaluating derivatives and finding heat capacities and defining heat capacities, which is just a derivative or a slope, let's call it, of some of the values in your tables. If we look at our saturation tables, you recall that the volume of a mixture, for instance, volume of a mixture, was equal to 1 minus the quality of the fraction of the liquid times the volume of the liquid, plus the fraction of the vapor times the volume of the vapor. So it's a weighted average of the liquid value and the vapor value in your mixture. So um, what that reduces it to that's convenient sometimes is this VFG or the change of volume. If we if we do this algebraically, you see we have VF plus rearranging. This becomes VF plus X times VG minus VF, and this VG minus VF is the is the uh, change in volume on vaporization. Many times that will be listed in your tables, and so it's convenient to calculate the volume as of the mixture is VF plus XVFG. I don't personally like it. Um, it saves you a little bit of time if you use that formula, but I like to stick with the uh, fraction of the liquid times the volume of the liquid plus the fraction of the vapor times the volume of the vapor. It keeps the understanding a little more clear, but you'll often see this shortcut used. Now I want to define enthalpy. We may have talked about enthalpy a little bit before, but I want to define it and what we use it for, why we use it. Tell you a little bit about that. Enthalpy H is a very commonly used uh, used variable in thermo, and it's defined as U plus P times V. Now, I think in an earlier uh, talk we described um, the flow work is pressure times volume. When you're pushing something into a system, it has a pressure and a volume as it goes across the boundary of the system, and that's flow work. So anytime we have mass moving into or out of the system, then we have flow work, and we have to add it when we're doing an energy balance on the system, or when we're accounting for the energy in the system. So this enthalpy is a convenience property that'll, that's listed in the tables, where PV has already been calculated and added to the internal energy, that allows you to just use enthalpies in your energy balances whenever the mass is moving into or out of the system. Note that PV has units of kilopascal meters cubed per kilogram, and a kilopascal meter cubed turns out to be a kilojoule, and so P times specific volume comes out in units of kilojoules per kilogram. If you're calculating it from P times V, you need to be careful that your units are consistent, so you don't want to use bars here or pascals. You want to use kilopascals. With, a, um, with the English system, it's a little more complicated, so I'll leave it as an exercise for you to convert PSI feet cubed. So you have this PSI feet cubed per pound mass when you multiply standard units, English units of P times V. You'll need to convert that over to BTUs per pound mass. So be aware that any time you're adding PV plus U, internal energy, then you're going, to need to, you're going to need to be careful with the units. Then we'll have a subcooled liquid. So if we're between, if we're right at saturated, then we'll have a mixture. But if we're on the hot side, we'll have a superheated vapor. On the cold side, we'll have a subcooled liquid. So we have to have tables for that. Uh, let's talk about the superheated vapor tables. We, uh, we call these steam tables. You often hear tables referred to as steam tables because we're talking about water, and water is widely used as a working fluid in thermo. So most thermotex that you'll put pick up will have a, a set of steam tables in them. You'll also have uh, refrigerant tables, and the refrigerant will also have a superheated vapor. In fact, any substance can go into a vapor state at some point, and then you would call it 
superheated, whether it's steam or refrigerant or even air. Air, again, at most common temperatures is above its critical point, so you're going to be in the superheated region almost always for air. All right, I want to talk about interpolation in tables. Interpolation is when the value isn't listed exactly in the table. How do you find the value? How do you find it? We use interpolation to find values between two listed values. For instance, uh, an example I'll do is at 215 degrees, you have values listed for 210, maybe, and 250. And then you have to find it in between at 215. We interpolate what we call linear interpolation. Now, since there's two dimensions, you can have two types of interpolation, simple or single variable interpolation, or more complex double interpolation. Now, I'll cover it a little bit in the slides, but I think I'm going to skip over it mostly because this relies on um, multivariable calculus to fully understand it, and a lot of you haven't had that yet. It's not a prerequisite for this course, so uh, I'm going to hold you to being able to do simple interpolation, and I'll go over a little bit about double interpolation for your benefit, but I'm not going to require that you're proficient at that yet for this course, let's say. So let's take an example. Given water at 200 degrees C and 1 bar, by the way, 1 bar is 100 kilopascals, which is 0 0.1 megapascals. So if your tables are listed in megapascals, then you'll, uh, you'll be using 0 0.1 megapascals for this problem. If you go to your tables, you'll find that at 1 bar, or at 0.1 MPA, the saturated temperature is 99.63. Well, here you're greatly above that. You're at 200 degrees C. 200 degrees C, so that's quite a bit above the saturation temperature of 99.63. So what is it? A liquid, a vapor, or a mixture? Well, we determine that it is a vapor a superheated vapor because it's at a temperature higher than its saturated temperature for that pressure. If you look it up in the tables for superheated vapor at 200 degrees C, you'll find that the volume is approximately 2.172 meters cubed per kilogram because you have in your tables a listing for 201 bar. Now let's take another example. Given water at 215 degrees C and 1 bar, what do you do? Well, what you do is you take the volume at 200 degrees plus how much it changes between 200 and, say, 250. The example I'm going to do is 240, but you could do it as well for 250 and come to a similar situation. The tables I had used prior were were uh, in increments of 40 degrees. Your tables, I think, are in increments of 50 degrees. So try and do this, what I'll do for 240, try to do for 250. So what we do is we take, we evaluate this slope, delta V, delta T, from the data in the tables. And then we multiply it times the difference in temperature 215 minus 200 relative to the point 200 at 200 degrees C, you'll see that the volume is listed, and so you can pull that up. So this is how you do a simple interpolation. Take 2.172 plus the delta V. See, this is the volume. Let's see, 2.359 is the volume at 240. You'll have to look up the one at 250 and correspond to 250 down here. But for the tables I used originally, this was 2.359 at 240. And then the values that you have at 200 are 2.172 and 200. So what you see this is, this is a slope delta V, delta T that you evaluate from the data in your tables in the region near your point, which is it between 200 and 240. Then you multiply times the distance over 
that you are the, uh, from the, your reference point. Your reference point is 200. Your actual temperature is 215. So that's what we call delta T. And when you're all done, you'll calculate 2.242. And I'd encourage you maybe to pause the, the tape now and then just calculate that out for yourself with the data in your tables only going from 250 um, rather than 240 degrees. You should get something very similar to this number 2.242 meters cubed per kilogram and that would be the volume at 215 degrees C and one bar or an estimate of the volume at 215 degrees C and one bar. Okay, I'm going to take a look at suppose we have water with V equals 2.3 and one bar and the question now is what is the temperature so you do a sort of reverse interpolation and you need to be able to do this as well again the same principle applies you'll get the slope delta V delta T from the data in your tables but now the unknown is the temperature so we'll take our reference state again and we'll put everything in. It's basically the same problem, only now the unknown instead of being the volume is the temperature. So 2.3 is the volume given and T is the unknown in that equation. So practice that. Do that again with, uh, with the data from your tables, which will have values of 250. And solve for T, you should get approximately 227.4 degrees C. Don't worry if it's a little bit off. What you're doing is a linear interpolation. You're assuming that it's linear between 200 and 240 or between 200 and 250. You're assuming that it's linear, that volume is linear with temperature in that region. Uh, in fact, volume should be fairly close to linear with temperature, but there are some cases where the value is not linear and you're still making a linear estimate by interpolating. Okay, by the way, those of you who have had multivariate calculus, this we did all this at constant P, so this delta V, delta T that we calculated from our tables, that slope that we calculated, is often called a partial derivative partial of V with respect to T at constant P. So those of you who have had uh, multivariate calculus will recognize that as a, a partial derivative. P was held constant in this particular derivative. Okay, as state properties, as state variables, the properties may be written as total derivatives. And for pure substances, recall that any property is a function of two other properties. So you can write it dv dt is equal to the change in v, change in v with respect to p dt plus the change in v with respect to p dp. I liken that as to going up a mountain. If dv were the change in height, then you'd have a slope in the, uh, in, say, in the uh, forward direction. Go, walking straight forward, you'd have a slope going up, but walking to your, so we could call this dz dx. This might be dz dy, where y is the direction to your right. So the total distance of the mountain, if you take a step to your left, take a step forward, you're going to go up some distance. And you take a step to your right, you may go up or down some distance, depending on what this second slope is. If we look at these as deltas rather than d's, in finite increments, then it comes to a little change, a slope, change with temperature, times a cha t the slope with respect to temperature. That would be what we have here, slope of volume with respect to temperature, times the change in temperature, plus how much volume changes with pressure, times the change in pressure. I can write this equation, actually this can be done with one equation in this case, where the volume is unknown, so 
the volume be my, be my unknown the equation, I can evaluate the slope with respect to v times the delta slope with, of v with respect to t times the delta t plus the slope of v with respect to p times the delta p. Given that, you can solve for v from the data in the tables. Putting, plugging all that in, and I'm going to go through this fairly fast because once again, this is uh, this is not something I'm going to require you to do at this time. And you get a volume of 2.428. Here's a more challenging problem. Given V and H, find T and P. That's kind of a challenge uh, double interpolation problem if you'd like to attack that. Okay. Uh, while we're on the subject of partial derivatives, or slopes, we can get this change in volume with respect to T another way. And we're going to get into ideal gas equations later, but you should see if it were an ideal gas, PV would be equal to M over molecular weight RT. RV would be equal to RT over P molecular weight. Then you can take the derivative with respect to T, RU over P times molecular weight. Plug the numbers in with your value for R. Taking the derivative, the T drops out, and you wind up with 0 0.006. Again, these last few slides, mainly what I want you to be able to do at this point is single variable interpolation. Luckily, it's an ideal gas in this case, and our, uh, our slope comes very close to the one that we calculated earlier at these conditions. We'll get into what's an ideal gas and what is not an ideal gas uh, later on in, a, in another uh, module. Okay, we've covered using tables, single interpolation, double interpolation, and evaluating partial derivatives from table data and from an ideal gas equation. So that covers a lot. Now let's look at energy. We've looked at volume quite a lot, and a lot of our examples have been with respect to volume, but a lot of times we need to find the energy, say the internal energy, or the, uh, or the enthalpy. One thing you should know is energy is relative. When we're doing energy balances, we're calculating it relative to some place that we call zero. That's referred to as the reference state. We want to know where the energy is equal to zero, and that's what we call the reference state. We can only calculate changes in energy, really, or we, we generally only calculate changes in energy, a delta U or a delta H when we're talking about properties. And so tables will generally be listed with some place that most people will agree to call the energy zero on, we often refer to that as the reference state. So if you look at your tables and you go to look at U, look and you'll find where U is zero and you'll find that it's pretty much going to be the freezing point of water or really actually technically it's usually the triple point of water where liquid water and ice and vapor water can all exist together. But that turns out to be just about 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees centigrade. And we'll take the enthalpy of the liquid to be 0. And we have to be very specific that we're talking about the enthalpy of the liquid because the energy of a liquid and the energy of a gas are radically different due to the energy of vaporization. So a change in internal energy we can write as a function of two variables, change in U with respect to T times a change in temperature plus a change in U with respect to volume times dV. It's often written that way. So these, the, remember that this uh, du dt at constant V is a slope of internal energy with respect to T and this du dV is a slope of internal energy with respect to V. 
So we can write this du dt at constant v. If v is constant, then our total energy change would just be this, the change in temperature times this slope du dv dt at constant v. Now this du dt at constant v is something that's widely used in thermo, and we use it so much we give it a name. We call it c sub v, or the constant volume heat capacity. That's delta u, delta t at constant v, or if you understand partials, it's du dt constant v. So that's called the CV, the constant volume heat capacity, and that's just something I wanted to bring up and define at this point. The next one is a change in enthalpy, and for a change in enthalpy we have dH equals the change in enthalpy at constant T, I mean, I'm sorry, change in enthalpy with respect to T, let me show you that, dH dT at constant P times the change in temperature plus the slope of enthalpy with respect to pressure at constant temp temperature times dP. That'll give us um, our total change in enthalpy, but if we hold P constant, then it's just dH dT at constant P times dT. Again, we use H quite a bit in some problems. Other problems we'll use U quite a bit. And so the dH dT is widely used in thermo, and we give that a name. We call that CP. So CP is defined as dH dT constant P, and that's referred to as the constant pressure heat capacity. Now, we can get CP and CV from the data in our tables fairly easily, so what I'd like you to do is uh, determine CP and CV for water from the data in your tables at the following conditions, at 200 degrees C and one bar, at 440 degrees C and one bar. And then let's do it at 200 degrees C and 100 bars. And there's some, uh, you know, little, little uh, quirky things in there. So uh, give it a go and see what you get. Finally, a little more homework. Chapter 3, I'll have problems posted on Blackboard that you can do. And also what I'd like you to do is for water and metric units, find the following properties. T, given that S equals 8 and P equals 1, S, and so on. Read those problems and then you can solve those. Okay, very good.